Descartes, the philosopher, said that the pineal was the seat of the soul. He said that because it's one of the few structures in the human brain that there's only one of them. You know, most structures, there's one on either side of the brain, so-called bihemispheric, but the pineal, there's only one. I don't know anything about souls, really. Um, Certainly not the science of souls, but I think it's very unlikely that the pineal is the seat of the soul, but it is a very interesting organ because it's the only organ in our body that releases melatonin. And that melatonin makes us sleepy and lets us fall asleep. Now, I'm guessing that many of you are probably asking, should I take melatonin? My personal bias on this is, except in rare cases, no, for the following reason. Melatonin has a second function, which is that melatonin also suppresses the onset of puberty. In kids, and especially in babies, melatonin isn't just released in the evening, 12 to 16 hours after we wake. Melatonin is released chronically or tonically throughout the day and night. And that chronic or tonic release of melatonin is known to suppress some of the other hormones in other regions of the brain that trigger the onset of puberty. Now, if you or your child has been taking melatonin, don't freak out. As always, any kind of uh, supplement or anything that you're going to take or think about taking, you really need to consult with your doctor. I've said this many times on this podcast and it's in the show notes, etc. But before you remove anything or add anything to what you're already doing, please do consult with a healthcare professional. However, melatonin is known to suppress the onset of puberty, so much so that regular cyclic cycled periods of melatonin release from the pineal really correlate with the onset of puberty and early adulthood. Meaning, as we start secreting melatonin only at night, that's also when we tend to transition out of puberty. Now, there are a lot of things that correlate in our nervous system, so it doesn't necessarily mean it controls it, but in this case, we know, based on lots of data, endocrinology and so forth, that melatonin suppresses the onset of puberty. So supplementing melatonin could be problematic for that reason, but if if you've already gone through puberty, it could also have some impact on other hormone systems in your body. So that's why I personally don't like to use melatonin to fall asleep. There's another reason, which is that melatonin will help you fall asleep, but it won't help you stay asleep. And many people who take melatonin find that they wake up three to five hours later, unable to fall back asleep. Part of the reason for that might be that melatonin purchased, uh, you can buy it over the counter in most areas of the world, even though it's a hormone, which is a little unusual. You can't just go into a pharmacy, at least in the US, and buy testosterone or cortisol or estrogen. You need a prescription, but you can go buy melatonin for whatever reason. I don't know the, the reasons for the, that um, legality. But it's been shown many times, and now I'm um, borrowing from some items that were in Matt Walker's book, Why We Sleep, where he stated the, there is evidence that in commercially available melatonin, the amount of melatonin has been tested for various brands, and it can range anywhere from being 15% of what's listed on the bottle, okay? So if they list this as 100 milligrams, would be a tremendously high dose. Uh, It turns out it's only 15 milligrams in that particular pill or capsule, or up to 400 times more than what's listed on the bottle. So it's completely unregulated. And so for those of you taking melatonin, I will discuss at the end of the podcast some other potential alternatives that are probably safer and don't have these issues. So should you take melatonin? My personal bias is no, but for many people, they find that it does help them. And so if you do find it helps you, then just consider what I'm saying in light of the other practices that you're doing and talk to your healthcare professional. Okay, so the rhythm of cortisol and melatonin is what we call endogenous. It's happening in us all the time without any external input. In fact, if we were in complete darkness, living in a cave with no artificial lights whatsoever, or we were in complete brightness where we never experienced any darkness, these rhythms of cortisol and melatonin would continue. You would have a bump in cortisol or a pulse in cortisol that would drop off with time, and then melatonin would come up about 12 to 14 hours later. But these endogenous systems of our body, which are both hormonal and neural, were set so that external things could govern when they happen. Now, so if you were in complete darkness, it would happen. 
darkness. It would happen once per 24 hour cycle, but it would be somewhat later and later each day. Whereas under normal, under normal circumstances, what happens is you wake up and what happens when you wake up? You open your eyes. When you open your eyes, light comes into your eyes. Now, the way this system works is that you have a particular set of neurons in your eye. They're called retinal ganglion cells. You don't have to remember that if you don't want to, but these retinal ganglion cells are brain neurons. Again, the retina is just the one piece of your brain, actually two pieces, because most of you have two retinas, that resides outside the skull per se. When light comes into the eye, there's a particular group of retinal ganglion cells or type of retinal ganglion cells that perceives a particular type of light and communicates that to this clock that resides right above the roof of your mouth called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, okay? So I know this can get a little complicated, but these retinal ganglion cells, when you open your eyes, light comes in and an electrical signal is sent to this central clock we call the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And the suprachiasmatic nucleus has connections with essentially every cell and organ of your body. Now, it's vitally important that we get light communicated to this central clock in order to time the cortisol and melatonin properly. When I say properly, I can say that with confidence because we know based on a lot of evidence that if you don't get your cortisol and melatonin rhythms right, there are tremendously uh, broad and bad effects on cardiovascular health, dementia, metabolic effects, learning, depression, dementia. In fact, there's so many negative effects associated with getting this wrong that I don't want to go into it in too much detail. In fact, I feel like we've been bombarded with all this information about how we're not sleeping well, we're not sleeping at the right times, we're not sleeping enough to the point where people now have sleep anxiety. They, they, if they can't sleep well for a night, they're feeling overwhelmed by that and it's sort of now they're stressed about not being able to sleep, which is making it harder to sleep, etc. I really want to focus on what we can do to anchor these systems properly. So let's think about what happens when we do this correctly and how to do it correctly. When we wake up, our eyes open. Now, if we're in a dark room, there isn't enough light to trigger the correct timing of this cortisol melatonin thing, these rhythms. You might say, well, why won't any light do it? Well, it turns out that these neurons in our eye that set the circadian clock and then allow our circadian clock to set all the clocks of all the cells and organs and tissues of our body responds best to a particular quality of light and amount of light. And those are the qualities of light and amount of light that come from sunlight. So these neurons, what they're really looking for, although they don't have a mind of their own, is the sun at what we call low solar angle. The eye and the nervous system don't know anything about sunrises or sunsets. It only knows the quality of light that comes in when the sun is low in the sky. The system evolved so that when the sun is low in the sky, there's a particular contrast between yellows and blues that triggers the activation of these cells. So if you wake up and you look at your phone or your computer, or you flip on a bunch of artificial lights, will these cells be activated? And the answer is sort of, they'll be activated, but not in the optimal way. What you want to do is get sunlight in your eyes as close to waking as possible. Now, I wanna be really clear about this because I've talked about it on other podcasts when I was a guest and I've talked about it on my Instagram feed and there seem to be the same questions coming up again and again. These neurons don't know sunlight per se. They don't know sunrise or sunset for that matter. They don't know artificial light from sunlight. What they respond best to, however, is the quality and amount of light that comes in when the sun is low in the sky. That means that if you can watch the sunrise, great. That's perfect for triggering activation of these cells. However, if you wake up a few hours after the sunrise, which I tend to most days personally, you still wanna get outside and view sunlight. You don't need the sunlight beaming you directly in the eyes. There's a lot of photons, light energy that's scattered from sunlight at this time. But the key is to get that light energy from sunlight, ideally, into your eyes. Now, I know many of you are already asking, well, I live in Scandinavia or I can't get sunlight. There's buildings around me, et cetera. We will get to all of that.